This is Real Estate Rookie episode 267. Whenever I get a property under contract, I always put a, a request, a public record request in with the city or the town and request inspection information or housing violations. And that gives you all the history on the property going as far back as you request. And that gives you insight into any legal issues that you're, you're having, you know, any troubled tenants, any issues with the building. And just that alone will give you insight into kind of what to look for when you do the inspection. Or it might give you insight into tools you can use for the negotiation and to ask for money off, right? So that's kind of one tip that I think a lot of people don't do, but it's really important with, with acquiring and doing your due diligence on a property. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. I want to start today's episode by shouting out someone by the username of Naftali B. And Naftali said, great show. Thank you, Ashley and Tony. I really enjoy listening to your show. You provide great tips, insights, and provide a true path for rookies to start investing in real estate keep those episodes coming. So for all of our rookies that are listening, if you have not yet left us an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please take the two minutes and like 17 seconds it takes to do that. Uh, the more reviews we get, the more folks we can help. And that's what we like to do here at the Real Estate Rookie Podcast is help people. Um, so what's up, Ash? How you doing today? Um, well, I just want to give a little warning uh, for this podcast. So um, if for some reason you hear fake throw up noises or you hear a bell ringing. Uh, my oldest son stayed home from school today and he had uh, three demands for me this morning. Uh, he just wanted Tim Horton's hot chocolate, a Tim Horton's breakfast sandwich and a bell to ring so that he didn't have to yell mom and could just ring the bell. So I went out and did my little errands this morning and I got the hot chocolate, I got the breakfast sandwich. I could not find a bell. So I got a cat collar with a little jingle bell on it. So he has a little cat collar that he's shaking and ringing for me, but he needs me in his room. But then uh, before we just, so usually on Tuesdays, Tony and I record all day. And so this is our last one. And right before this, he said to me, he's like, well, how long is it going to be? And I was like, I don't know, probably an hour and a half. And he said, well, do you think like you could just say, oh, my God, my son is throwing up. I have to go. <laughs> I said, I don't think you could do that. He's like, you can try it. <laughs> <laughs> so was he was he fake throwing up in the back? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I didn't hear it at least that I do have my noise canceling headphones on. So I don't know. Maybe it did come through the microphone, but uh, or the little cat collar digging. That's if hilarious. There is, if you guys hear anything in the background, that's. Full disclosure for what it is. <laughs> I, I, I love that he's like, I need a bell so I can I can beckon <laughs> you when I need something. <laughs> I know. <laughs> then I'm even worse for trying to fulfill that request, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I wish Sean would ask me for a bell. I'd be like, boy, if you don't get your foot up and <laughs> yeah. come in his living room. And... The, the, well, the thing is, whenever he is sick, he always just like, I want to go outside of the barn or I want to go out in the shop. I want to go outside and do this or whatever so the fact that you actually want to like stay inside i'm like you must actually really be sick so um well cool well we got a we got a good episode for today right we we bring on a guest by the name of andrew freed and uh andrew's got a really interesting story he talks about how he felt feels like he wasted most of his 20s and then had this awakening with what he calls the purple pill um so if you you guys want to stick around and figure out what the purple pill is and then he goes on to outlay how he's built a portfolio of 18 uh, about to be 24 units um, over the course of just a couple of years and just the entire story and his framework of, about working on himself first to become the type of person that can invest in real estate I thought was really eye-opening. Yeah that personal development he did as to like looking at his life as you know, I'm living the American dream I'm a you know have a nice W2 job I bought a condo I you know can do whatever I want basically and um it just he came to that realization where even though I have everything that I'm supposed to when, you know, you graduate college, you get your job, everything, you buy your house. He's like, it just wasn't fulfilling to me. And I realized that I'm actually still living paycheck to paycheck. And what happens if I lose my job? I have to go get another job. And just like that, that had instilled a fear into him. So he talks about that whole progression and how he kind of realized, realized those things and just how he's been able to grow his portfolio in a, a short period of time. And he has a strategy that he's doing to implement um, lines of credits to help him further his strategy. 
but also stresses on the importance of having reserves and different exit strategies in case you do get over leveraged with yourself. Well, Andrew, welcome to the Real Estate Rookie podcast. Uh, you want to just start off telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate? Absolutely. So, you know, I first want to mention I'm ecstatic to be here. Bigger Pockets was in- instrumental in my success in real estate. I literally I found my mentor on Bigger Pockets. I found many syndicators uh, on Bigger Pockets, and I've gotten all of my questions answered. So I literally wouldn't be here today without Bigger Pockets. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah, man. And uh, and just really quick, on behalf of Bigger Pockets, you're very welcome. I think Ash and I love hearing stories like that. And even though the, our podcast is relatively new, we just get to take the credit for all of the other things that Bigger Pockets has done. So we we appreciate that, man. But no, seriously, I, I think Ash and I both, we were products of the Bigger Pockets community before we became hosts. So we know firsthand just how influential of a platform this is and then how many lives have been changed. So uh, Andrew, I, we appreciate you sharing that as well, man. I mean, we're still the biggest bigger pockets groupies there are. <laughs> still to the, you know. <laughs> well, sorry, man. I didn't, I didn't mean to get you off track from your story, but I just wanted to comment on that. I appreciate that. Of course, of course. So, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in real estate for about a little over two years now. Uh, I'm a multifamily buy and hold investor. I'm currently up to 18 units in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm about to close on a six unit, so I'm about to be at 24 units. I'm also an investor focused agent. You know, in my first year, I closed about 10, 10 deals. Um, and I'm also a W2 certified project manager, which really, um, those skills really fit well uh, with the real estate investor. So that's kind of where I am and what I've done over my course in kind of real estate. You know, when we were at the Bigger Pockets conference, Tony and I did like a workshop thing. And we had somebody raise their hand and say that, you know, they were in their W2 job now and they were a project manager and they just felt like they had no skills for real estate and you know, they wanted to partner with somebody, but didn't know what they could bring to the table. And it was just like, be your project manager. Tell us a little bit about what you do. And then we hit the next question we asked was, who here would love somebody to manage the rehab project for them? You know, like every hand shot up in the room, but like, that is such a great skill set to have. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit more about how you've used project management into your real estate investing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it really comes down to being proactive, um, following up constantly, um, and time efficiency, right? So some of the principles I live by on a daily basis is the Pareto's principle, which 20% of your inputs create 20, uh, 80% of your outputs. So every single day in the morning, you know, I'll figure out my year goals. I'll break it down quarterly, monthly, weekly. And what can I do today? What three, five items can I do today to get me to my goals? And those are usually high impact Items like, you know, walking properties, making offers, talking with brokers, talking with lenders. And I avoid time wasting things like organizing my email um, and things like that. So um, time efficiency is, is at the, you know, the precipice of being a good project manager. And, you know, it's truly what you really, really, I mean, it's a great skill to have in real estate as well. I mean, you know, all of us wear 20 hats and, you know, we only, we all have the same amount of time in the day, right? So we kind of have to be very efficient with that. I love the idea of the Pareto principle, and I think it doesn't get enough love. And it's so easy to be busy and not be productive. And I think most people, especially when you're dealing with limited time, like if you're looking to be a real estate investor and you also have a day job, you also have family commitments, you also have maybe community commitments, like whatever it is, you need to be able to be exceptionally productive with the little time that you have available uh, to work on your real estate business. So I guess my first question, Andrew, is, how did you make the determination or how did you come to decide what was that 20% of activity that was going to produce 80% of your results? You know, that's a great question. More or less kind of the activities that get me to closer to my goal. So we all need, we all need money to buy real estate. So I utilize lines of credit, right? You know, maybe that's locating partners. Maybe that's underwriting deals. It's whatever next steps I can get to that are going to get me to my goals. So I always wanted to be an entrepreneur at heart. I always wanted to control my future. I mean, maybe that was just a result of my last name being freed, but I really felt the need to really create, um, take control of my time and really create the reality that I want. So I, you know, I took many entrepreneurship classes. I, I even wrote a business plan for my master's program. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, my entire network, um, you know, are, are have the middle class mindset, you know, get a good job, you know, uh, work for a good company, you know, make good money. And I really took that to heart. Was there one thing that kind of like 
made you like was there it, it, a moment where you can like remember this was like the thing that made you want to change yeah i mean the real moment that was that really hit for me is when you know come come around covid you know i did everything right when it comes to achieving the middle class dream you know I, you know, got a good job at a prestigious organization. You know, I made six figures. I had, you know, my own condo in Boston. You know, I really did everything you needed to do to, uh, quote unquote, achieve the American dream. You know, at the end of the day, I really looked at my life, really looked at my net worth. And I realized at the end of the day, I'm still paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, maybe I have six months of savings, maybe a year of savings. But, you know, at the end of the day, like if they fired me, I would rely on that job six months, 12 months later. Um, and that, you know, that really frightened me. That really frightened me to death, to be honest with you. So, you know, I, I kind of ate the purple pill. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that really opened my eyes to the possibility of the world. So, you know, I very much drowned my ambition in video games. I, in video games, I always kind of created the character I wanted, created the avatar I wanted, focus on the skills that I wanted. And I really wasted a majority of my 20s in that state of mind. However, after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I came to the realization that, you know, at the end of the day, life is a video game. Why create a character in, in a virtual reality when I can create the avatar and the person that I want to be in this reality, right? So that was kind of the real turning point for me. Um, and that really kind of uh, gave you the ambition to really go full force in the real estate. Just really quickly, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm, I appreciate you being transparent about you almost looking for this escape with like gaming. And I, I think it's going to be a different escape for every person, but I think all of us find ourselves getting lost in these things that are entertaining or they are you know, they, they make us feel good momentarily but in the reality they're at least the amount of time we're putting into it detract from our ability to achieve our goals long term and maybe for some people it's TikTok, right maybe for other people it's you know netflix maybe for some people it's um who knows what it is but everyone has their their vice that can in the moment feel like a good thing but really it's it's hurting you from achieving the goals that you want in life so I guess my my question is how did how did you break that habit? Because I think so many people have these things that they've established in their in their lives, these rhythms that they find them, themselves in, and it, it's so hard to kind of break free from that because the momentum's been building for so long. So how did you kind of change your your mindset and, and change your behavior to say, hey, I'm going to break away from this negative habit and and really focus that energy on something more fruitful? You know, uh, many people want the rewards of the external environment to give them their dreams. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you want the external environment to give you what you're looking for, you really have to look internal and you have to really cure those inner demons first before you can expect the external world to provide, you know, what you want for your dream. So, you know, the way I did that was, you know, I spent I spent a good two to three hours in self-development every single day. You know, I'm trying to create the avatar, you know, the character that I want to create to, to bring the reality to this world that I want. So every single morning, you know, I'll, I'll spend an hour doing Miracle Morning. You know, I'll meditate, I'll write, I'll scribe, I'll go through my yearly goals and figure out what I can do that day to get me to my goals. And really the most important thing that really brought me to this next level is just practicing gratitude. You know, all of us are really lucky to live in the United States. We're literally the, the top 1% uh, of the 1% of wealthy people in, in the entire world. So, you know, just being grateful for what you have and the opportunity that get that is given you really has really pushed me to to really go after my goals and and you know, not rest until I achieve them. That's such a great point. Like I can find myself sometimes just like sitting in my car and like frustrated over something or stressed about something or just in a bad mood. And if I just like focus on like a couple things that I'm super grateful for, like a smile just appears on my face and you like feel that energy build up in you. And I remember going to a conference where somebody led like a, a seminar about just like how you're like positioning yourself. So like if you're hunched over, then everybody, you know, like sit up, put your shoulders back and like you already feel better about like your situation and things like that. But and I think those are just such little easy things, but you you don't, you forget sometimes you don't always do it, but like Andrew, you're getting into that habit of doing it every single day, like feeling that grateful, like expressing that gratitude for what you do have. And it can be like the smallest of things. Like I remember when my kids went to private school, we did it during COVID. So they didn't have to go virtual and they could go in school, but there was no bus system. And I was like, oh, every day I'm going to have to drive them to school and I'm going to have to pick them up every day. And I had a friend who it didn't even know I was going through this situation who said to me, 
oh, I'm like so lucky with this job that I have. I get to drive my daughter to school every day. I get to do that. I get to spend those 20 minutes in the car with her. And I was just like, wow, I've been thinking about it so wrong. Like, I need to be grateful of like that I get to. Like, I don't have anything else to do. I can go and drive my kids to school. I get that time with them. And then I'm able to do that where not everyone has that opportunity. And I was looking at more than inconvenience when it really wasn't. Um, so I think that's great. And Hal Elrod is the one who writes that book, Miracle Morning, that you were referring to. Um, great book for anyone that wants to to check that out. Yeah, you know, I, th- I think that's a great point. I mean, just going back to that, I mean, just being very conscientious of where your thoughts go. And the fact that whether you're ruminating on something negative or whether you're ruminating on something that will get you towards your goals, right? So that's that really has, you know, been instrumental for me is kind of controlling where my thoughts go and focusing on things that get me towards my goal and literally pushing that behind you. And, you know, for your example, you were focusing on the negative, like, oh, this is wasting my time. I'm driving my children to school. But if you just switch that and focus on the positive, you know, I get to spend time with my children. I get to enjoy them in the morning. I get to enjoy their spirit, driving them home. That really changes the whole dynamic of the situation. It really puts that gratitude, you know, in in the for, forefront for sure. Andrew, what do you think is like the biggest impact you've had from this, like implementing the miracle morning and expressing gratitude and, you know, scribing all these different things? And are you actually like tracking any of this? Like, are you, you know, looking and seeing like, okay, I've been doing this for, 100 days now and I see like an impact on like your productivity or whatever it is. Yeah. So I do definitely utilize a habit tracker every single day. I'll have my, you know, nine, 10 items, what I want to do. And I really focus on getting them done in the first two, three hours a day. And once I actually tackle those habits, everything else seems easy, right? So when you really tackle hard things early, hard things throughout the day, just come, just go with the flow, right? So that's kind of been, um, been really good for my success is really just tracking those habits, really focusing them on them on a daily basis. So Ed, when you started doing this, was this before you got your first deal? And that's kind of helped you lead into that? Or was that after? And you want to maybe talk about the first deal? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, that this was all before my first deal. You know, I really, I really got into mindset. I really got into habit tracking. I really got into education, learning as much as I could. I think I listened to all like six or 700 bigger pockets podcasts. Um, so I really did focus on that, Uh, but it really led me into my first deal and the fact that, you know, it set me up with the, with the right, with the right partners. It put me in the right market um, and it really, um, it gave me the right strategy. So I ended up utilizing the house hack strategy. I got, I opened up a a line of credit on my one bedroom condo in Boston, uh, around $200,000. And I used that as seed money to buy my next seven deals. So I bought two house hacks. I invested in two, three families. Uh, I bought a five family. I invested in two syndications. I'm currently closing on a six family right now. Um, so, you know, just, just, and, you know, to your point that those, those habits gave me the confidence to really go after my dream. I didn't have to question whether I had the knowledge or whether I knew the right people. It really gave me, um, the confidence to experience failure and really, um, really just thrive. Andrew, so, so many good things that you just said right now. I just want to take a quick second to unpack some of that. So you said those habits gave me the confidence that I needed. And it, it's such an important idea for our Ricky listeners to understand because so often we have these goals that we set and the goals seem almost so far-fetched because it's like, I don't know anyone that's doing those things. I've never done that myself. Is it even possible? Is it just a dream? So the question isn't always like, what do I need to do to, to, to achieve those goals? The question we need to ask ourselves sometimes is, who do I need to become in order to achieve those goals? And you are like the perfect picture of what that looks like because before we even started talking about analyzing deals or choosing your market or doing this or doing that, the technical stuff about real estate investing, you looked inward and said, what do I need to do internally with inside of me? Who do I need to become if I want to be the type of person that can invest in real estate? So I, I just really wanted to call that out because I think it's it's such an important concept for our regular listeners to understand. Um, and then one other follow-up question, like when you had this, you know, uh, I guess enlightening moment, this awakening inside of you and you went through the, these changes internally, how much time passed from from that moment until you actually got that first deal? So I think I read Rich Dad um, April 2020 so a month after covid you know i had all this time in my hands and 
you know, and I, I was getting sick of video games, like, oh, I'm gonna pick up this book. And, um, and honestly, like that book, literally like tears were rolling down my face, you know, that book really changed my whole mindset. Um, and it really just showed me that, you know, I was honestly just avoiding my dream of entrepreneurship because I was scared of failure, right? So um, when it comes to real estate and getting a deal under contract, you know, you could do all the prep work you want. You could do all the due diligence. You never know what's going to happen until you close in the, that property and you have that property, you know, you own that property more or less. So um, it's really important to just be confident in your ability and know that you're going to tackle any issue that comes your way, right? Um, so that confidence is instrumental to any rookie. I mean, you know, you just have to be confident in your ability to, to really just anything that comes your way, you can definitely, um, yeah, definitely tackle. Sorry, little... No, no, it's okay. And I think it's, it's another important point is that repetition builds confidence, right? And the more you do something, the more confidence you start to build in yourself to actually do that thing successfully. And I think so many people have this I don't know that this warped sense of of what it means to like make progress towards something but first is that we need to understand we have to do the work initially to build that foundational level of of confidence and, and understanding and the second piece is that as you move through these steps towards success more often than not you are going to make some mistakes and some things are going to go wrong does that necessarily mean that you failed not really right because mistakes and missteps that's part of the the progress or the the process towards success but i think we have this fear that we build up to say if i make a single mistake it means i'm a total failure um but i'm assuming austin that a lot of that work you did about your mindset and your gratitude and the habits you were building helped you understand that failure and mistakes are part of the process yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I learn my best lessons when I fail. You know, I when I make a mistake, I know I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make that mistake again because I'm fully aware of it. So I value, I appreciate failure on a daily basis. And I know that that's going to that's going to make me a stronger person. And that's going to allow me to take on bigger and, and tougher challenges throughout my investing career. Andrew, I want to know what kind of, you know, hats you're wearing in your business. Are you you know, are you managing, self-managing? Are you outsourcing the property management? Are you hiring contractors to do rehabs? Do you, you know, are you finding deals yourself? Do you have a wholesaler? Do you have a real estate agent? What does that kind of look like? Because it's, you have a full-time W-2 job. What other things are you doing for your business besides just being the investor? Totally. So I couldn't even change a light bulb. So I absolutely contract out all of that work. But everything else I do, you know, I'm, I'm an agent, you know, I source all of my own deals, e either I've gotten a majority of my deals on the MLS, but I've gotten a few off market as well. Um, you know, I self manage all of my units. So all my tenants have my number, they reach out directly to me. Um, and, you know, um, and for my W2, you know, technically, that's a 40 hour work week. So I do that as well. So this all comes back to time efficiency, right? Like focusing on the 20% of inputs that create 80% of the output. So in all of my, in all of my careers or my jobs are really focused on the tasks that are really instrumental towards my success in that particular field. Um, and, and like, for example, for my W2, you know, I'm, I'm a finance guy. I have to make sure my projects, um, are alloc are, um, budgeted correctly and are spending in accordance with the trend. And, you know, that, that's essentially what I focus on is kind of um, you know, the money side of it, right? Because everybody's got to poke me once we go into deficit. Everybody's got to poke me once we're losing money. So I really try to focus on profitability. Does it, you think that like it just, it gives you that little like edge up because you're focused on that compared to maybe somebody else who's not really tracking their budget, that that's where you're seeing the real like value in your investment is because you're taking the time to be so detailed and that's where you're kind of seeing your return on investment there. I mean, as, as you both know, the work is the work is in the due diligence and, and being proactive, right? So if you um, if you do your work up front to make sure the project runs smoothly, that everybody's on the same page, that all of your tools are readily available if things come your way, you know, the project, the projects a lot of times just run themselves, right? They may, they, and as long as you're monitoring, you know, your rehab or you're monitoring, um, you know, your, your long-term rental or you're monitoring your clients, you know, as long as you set them off on the right track and monitor them on a, on a weekly or a monthly basis to get them back on track, that's really the key to being a successful project manager and really have wearing multiple hats 
is just being extremely detour- detail-oriented and being proactive. Hey, you, you mentioned, uh, Andrew, about uh, being proactive and, and doing the work up front was what you said. And I love that phrase because I, I think doing the work up front is one of the most important things a new investor can do. Because if you do the right work up front when you're analyzing the deal, when you're sourcing the deal, on the back end, typically the management becomes a little bit easier. So I'm curious, Andrew, with the 18 units you have right now, plus another six on the way, what does a, a deal look like for you? And where do you kind of see these opportunities coming? So it's, it's all about s- systematizing and automating um, the acquisition side as well as the stabilization side. So in regards to the acquisition phase, you know, there are some key metrics that I look at when it comes to buying multifamily units. One of the one of the easiest metrics that I think everybody can utilize with quick underwriting is what is your all in cost per unit, right? So say for example, the unit costs one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, and it's going to cost you fifteen thousand dollars per unit to bring it to stabilization. No, your all in cost for that unit is one hundred and forty thousand. If if units in the area are trading for two hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand, you barely have to underwrite that deal to know you've got a good deal, right? Um, and the other the other key metric I use is post stabilization cash on cash return. Um, you know, I like to ensure all of my tenants are month to month to ensure there is a quick path to stabilization. But by u- utilizing those two metrics, I can really underwrite properties extremely quickly and know if it's a good deal or not. And then if, if it is a good deal, then I can kind of dig in deeper. So that's kind of on the acquisition side. You know, once I actually get a property under contract, um, there's a, I'll just give you a couple tips of what I do. But this one tip I think will save people thousands of dollars. Whenever I get a property under contract, I always put a, a request, a public record request in with the city or the town. And that will, and requesting um, inspection, inspectional information or housing violations. And that gives you all the history on the property going as far back as you request. And that gives you insight into any legal issues that you're, you're having, you know, any troubled tenants, any issues with the building. And just that alone will give you insight into kind of what to look for when you do the inspection. Or it might give you insight into into tools you can use to to leverage to for the negotiation and to ask for money off, right? So that's kind of one tip that I think a lot of people don't do, but it's really important with with acquiring and doing your due diligence on a property. I, I want people to really like listen to that because that is a great piece of advice that I don't think a lot of people talk about enough. And the first time that was introduced to me was purchasing a campground. I actually had the building inspector for that town call me. He got my attorney's information and asked for my information, called me directly to say, I heard you're interested in buying this property. We really want to see it like turn around. I just want you to know all the, here are all the issues with it. Like it had failed, like it had like a sewer treatment system. Mm -hmm. If we had all of these things that didn't pass inspection that were failing and he's like, yeah, I, you know, stop into my office. I will give you the history of everything. And he's like, I just want somebody to come in who's actually going to take care of the property and, you know, pay the taxes on it and things like that. And, <laughs> but it really was so like, there was things that obviously weren't disclosed that we never would have known about unless we had gone and got those public records from the the town hall there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I got a property under contract and in, in that report, it mentioned the roof leaking, right? So that was a really good point for me to fo- to point my inspector on and really focus on those issues. So it's incredibly powerful, as you mentioned, with doing your due diligence, because I mean, every property has the history and most of the time the town or the city has that information. Here's another one too, that I've seen come up too, is um, any health code violations like uh, problems with the water. So like if a tenant had called and said that, you know, they want the water tested, things like that, or also um, like rats a rat infestation, like calling and saying that, you know, that's, there's a rat infestation, the landlord hasn't taken care of it, things like that. Just going back through that history and like the rat thing had been taken care of, but like, it was just like, okay, is the whole house, so, you know, all the wires chewed up from rats, <laughs> you know, living in the walls of that property. And just like one more thing to to check on. Yeah. Then, you know, once you actually acquire the property, you do due diligence, which um, make sure you always get the estoppels, by the way, for multifamily heat. You want to make sure the the tenant signs off on their rental amount because that's almost more important than the lease. Can you just tell everyone what an estoppel agreement is? Estoppel agreement is essentially the tenant signing off on the rental amount, who's responsible for the utilities, whether they're paid up to date, get as much information on that estoppel as possible and have the tenant sign off on it because 
if they if they sign off on it, it's going to be way easier to have that conversation with them when you show them their signature, right? Can you also spell estoppel? <laughs> I can. I've E S T O P P E L. There you go, man. I remember the first time I heard it, I had to like ask that person that told me about the estoppel agreement like five times because I didn't understand what language they were speaking in and i had to like google it to really understand so uh, i just want to make it easy for the folks to listen to to google that later if they need to i feel like that was me because i feel like you've asked me to spell it before or like no. you just <laughs> asked you to spell it because of yeah the first i just like I, yeah just because that first situation i know i was so bad at trying to understand how to spell it phonetically i couldn't figure it out so you know what you should at one of your events tony you should do that as like a competition like the first person to spell, <laughs> spell, spell, spell correctly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad idea uh, Banjo, go ahead. Yeah, we're going to continue with the stabilization piece on the properties. Yeah, so once you actually acquire the property, you know, you have to stabilize. And when it comes to stabilizing, you just want to make sure you, you develop the stabilization plans weeks in advance. Like, what's your plan to get this to stabilization? And one of the key important pieces of information is ensuring tenants a month, month to month. You know, as we all know, leases go with the building, right? So if, so, if the whole building's on year leases, you're not going to be able to stabilize that or get the rents closer to market until a year occurs, right? So set up your stabilization plan, and then develop a welcome letter, right? Um, with how they're gonna pay rent. And I'd like to ensure all of that is automated. I use apartments.com and all of that just automatically deducts from the account on the first of the month. Um, you know, who they reach out for maintenance requests. Um, and then I also like to set up a meeting with them, really to kind of establish rapport, you know, explain that, you know, the, the rules of the property, as well as have a conversation about, you know, where rents are and where they need to be. And I usually utilize the binder strategy to get the rents closer to market. Um, you know, I know, I know most real estate investors um, kick out inherited tenants, but a majority of my portfolio is actually inherited tenants. I think 11 of my 18 units are inherited tenants and most of them are close to market. Um, and the way I really did that was I utilized the binder strategy on day one. You know, I went to them and I explained, you know, this is market. This is what you pay. What do you think's fair? And it's usually human nature to choose the 50% mark, right? So a lot of times they'll choose right in the 50% mark. And then at that point, I explain to them, you know, I asked them, first of all, I asked them, you know, is there anything I can fix in the building that, that would make your experience better? And usually it's something small like, you know, change the thermostat or change my faucet, which I'm always happy to do because that really establishes the rapport up front and that really gets their buy-in for the rent increase. And then I also kind of address what I'm going to do to improve the property. And then I go about it. I go about my stabilization plan. I improve the property. Come around six months, eight months later, I have another binder strategy conversation with them. And I get them closer to market. At that point, maybe they're 100 or they're $200 below market. I'm okay with that. Because the turning unit literally costs ten dollars to $15,000. How long is it going to get take me to get a return on investment on a $100, $150 difference? It's literally going to take me seven, eight, nine years, right? So before I kind of get tenants out, I kind of do that calculation in my head of what makes sense, right? Um, and it's, it's worked extremely well. As I mentioned, a lot of my portfolio are inherited tenants. Everybody pays me on time. Everybody treats my unit right. Um, and yeah, it's been a great experience. Actually, I'm, I'm curious because I've, you know, Andrew, we, we've interviewed a lot of people and I don't think I've ever heard anyone freeze it the way that you just did. So articulately is, is that sometimes keeping a tenant below market rents is better than turning that property and increasing the rents. I mean, actually, you know, for, for most of your properties, do you kind of go along that same line of thinking where you'd rather keep that tenant in place, even if they're paying a little bit less than market rent? Yeah. Especially when first purchasing the property, because there's so many upfront costs when purchasing the property, like you have your closing cost and you, you know, just like Maybe there's some maintenance or repairs that need to be upfront, just like your attorney fees, all these things. Um, you know, when my property management company for every new property you add on, there's like an upfront fee, things like that to do. So, yeah, like keeping them in. And also the property management company charges a leasing fee, which is one month's rent. So like the turnover of that, you have to pay them to go and change the locks, things like that. So I've definitely kept people in properties. Um, I usually like to give them an option where maybe I increase the rent a little bit or, you know, they have the option to to vacate the property. But I've rented, you know, units out like trying to get the max dollar and I ended up getting bad tenants because there it wasn't, a you know, at market rent. So the pool to pick from was very slim and it was people who 
thought they could afford, but actually couldn't afford and then ended up being, you know, non-paying tenants. So um, that's like a big thing that I've realized over the years that sometimes it's actually better to be a little bit below market. So you have a larger pool of tenants to select from. But I've heard it other ways too, that like the more you push the price, then maybe you're only going to get the people that can afford it and you'll get a higher quality tenant. So for me, I'm just not investing in high end areas, I guess, where I have the that kind of, you know, like white collar um, W-2 high income earners to, to select from. Yeah. And I mean, just to your point, I mean, I, a lot of my units, I'll allow cats and dogs because if you remove cats and dog, you're literally removing 50% of your tenant pool. Yeah. Right. Um, and then as, as you both know, a lot of these large multis will have pests, will have rats. Right. I actually love cats because if there's a cat in the unit, you will never see a mouse. <laughs> That's <laughs> so true. I welcome cats. I literally don't even charge a cat fee. <laughs> I was just going to say, Andrew, just to clarify, because you mentioned the binder method, but I, like, can you just like in one sentence just define what that is? Because you, you talked about it in passing, but just for folks who aren't familiar with that method, what exactly is the binder method by definition? Yeah, absolutely. More or less, it's just, you know, you're having a conversation with a tenant and you're really just showing them, you know, what market rent is, what do they pay? And then you just have a conversation with them on what they think is fair. Right. And like I said, most of the time it's human nature to choose the 50% mark, because even if they get, even if it's like, say it's you know, uh, 2000 is market. They're paying a thousand. Even if they choose 1500, they still, they still know they're getting a deal. If they have rented an apartment right down the road, the same exact apartment, it's going to cost them $2,000. So a lot of times they will, they will actually implement the rent increase on themselves well, rather than you having to implement it, which is really key because you want them to buy into it, right? If you force it on them, there's going to be less buy-in and a higher likelihood of them having to be, um, evicted or you have tenant issues. Um, so that's kind of, that, that's the binder strategy in a nutshell, more or less. And I like to use it twice. I'll use it initially. And then I like to use it later on once I, in, once I, um, approve the property, address some of the issues that the tenant have and show, show them that I am working to make the property better. Um, at that point that the, the, the second binder go around tends to be pretty successful as well. Andrew, do you want to take us through, um, one of your deals for us? Do you have one in mind that you want to kind of go through the numbers? Totally. Totally. So. I closed on um, this three family with a partner uh, back in June 2022 um, in Worcester, Massachusetts. We got the three family uh, for five hundred thousand uh, dollars. It was relatively turnkey. Um, it was in great shape. The real value add there was rents were far below market. Right. So our strategy there was two of the tenants were on Section eight month to month. And then one of the tenant was just a normal tenant. Um, so, you know, we, we gave them the welcome letter and we met with them. Right. And our strategy there was kind of contact section eight request, request a, a rent increase and get it closer to market, which was a successful strategy. We actually ended up doing that in, in two or three months. Um, the last unit on day one, when we met them, they said, I just lost my job. I can't afford rent. So we're like, um, but we knew that the second unit was the first unit's mother. So rather than kicking out we're like oh why don't you move in with your mother right so she ended up moving with her mother we got that vacant as in one month and we rented that for 2150 um we rented the, the section eight brought the second unit up to around 1950 and then the third unit was a one bed we got around 1250 right so the pity on the building is around 2500 dollars, and the current revenue after about three months uh of stabilizing the property breaks out to around 5300 dollars. so it was pretty good. It was honestly, it was way easier than we expected. You know, um, just being em empathetic and kind to the first tour, first floor tenant really cemented ourselves to be able to really stabilize that building in a quick manner. We were expecting to go through an eviction process. What do you think that property is worth now, now that you've increased the rent? So you purchased for 500000 What would you say the, the value is on it now? So that's a three family, right? And as we know with residential, those are based off the sales comps approach, right? So in this, in this, um, stat in this sideways a downward market the value is probably pretty close to where we bought it maybe 10 20k higher right um but it's a fantastic cash flow and property but to that point that's really why i'm focusing on five plus unit buildings moving forward because i really want to focus on the buildings that are valued based on the income approach so i can get rewarded for the great stabilization that i do right 
So, you know, if I, if I stabilize these three families, if it produced 3000 in revenue and then suddenly it produces 5000 in revenue, the bill is really not going to sell for more a lot of times. But these five plus unit buildings, if I increase the revenue from $4,000 to $8,000, I have the ability to, you know, it's based off the cap rate. It's based on the income. I could refin refinance a lot of my money out. I could sell the building. I could 1031 it. It gives me a lot more escape strategies. Um, and it really rewards me for my stabilization ability. Yeah. So really it's how the appraisal is done is what you're looking for as to using the sales-based approach or the income-based approach. And when the appraiser is going to use that on the five plus units, you're seeing it more of an advantage to you because you're doing that forced appreciation by increasing the income, even though there may be properties around you that are still selling for, you know, at $500,000, but you've increased your your income on that property, which is going to, you know, they're not going to look at those comps for, you know, compare it to that. It's going to be the income on the property to show its value. Yeah. And it just allows me to keep up the velocity of my money, right? I have more ability to take money out of that deal and put that into my next deal, which is that's essentially how I've built my portfolio is utilizing the equity of all my properties. I mean, how long would it take you to save 20, 25% of a $500,000 property? It would take most people three, four, five years. The only way most real estate investors scale is utilizing their equity. And that's kind of how I scaled. And I'm planning on scaling in the future. Andrew, how did you find your partner on this deal? Um, I found my partner in my meetup. I actually host a local meetup uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, and I met them there. Um, and I saw they were doing big things. They owned about the same amount of units I had. Um, and yeah, we just kind of connected, right? Um, and then one day he just asked me, he's like, I see this great deal in the MLS. You want to walk it? I'm like, sure. So I actually walked the property. It was relatively turnkey, which honestly, that's kind of... Um, what I like to purchase is I like to purchase properties that, uh, maybe have minor cosmetic upgrades, maybe one cap capex item, but more or less they they don't require a lot of money to stabilize. It's more on the management side. Rents are way below market. Um, that's kind of how I focus on stabilizing property and this kind of fit right into that bucket. So I walked the property. It looked great. I looked at him and he's looked at me and we're like, let's do this and split 50, 50. And yeah, it was a great deal. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I also just want to comment, uh, Andrew, on on the meetup. So I am I am a huge proponent of new investors leveraging meetups both as attendees, but especially as hosts, as a way to to build their network in their local community. Um, when you when you made this decision to start the meetup, did you have like a big online presence or like this massive network of real estate investors you already knew? And if not, how did you go about promoting that meetup and, and getting people to to actually show up? I like to say this was completely intentional, but just like everything in life, it was just a random act, right? So I was actually looking for a mentor was kind of my real goal. I was looking for a mentor. Uh, I ran across a local mentor in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is about 45 minutes away from my city. And during one of his meetups, he mentioned, you know, I'm trying to start a meetup in Worcester, but I'm trying to look for a venue. Like, can anybody help me out? So I really took that to heart. And that weekend, I went to about six or seven different venues. I took video. I took pictures. I sent it to him. And he was like, wow, I've been asking somebody to do this for eight months. Nobody did it. Like, do you want to be our first guest at this meetup that I'm, that I'm starting? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll be happy to. So I ended up being the first guest. And after that, he, he asked me to actually host it. Um, and that's kind of how I first started with that mentor. Um, but yeah, I mean, more or less, it was just trying to provide value to other people. And in doing so, value was provided back to me. Ashley, me and you talk all the time about how new investors can find mentors by providing value first. And Andrew, what you just described is the ultimate perfect example of a way to provide value to someone that you hope will in turn you know, provide value to you in the form of mentoring or some sh shape or form. Like the fact that this person was standing up in the room saying, man, I'm really stuck. I can't find a place to do this thing. And you spent an entire weekend doing it for him and then sent him all the information that he needed. Those are the kind of things that endear someone to you to make them want to take time out of their busy schedule to say, Andrew just did this for me. Law of reciprocity says, I want to, I want to pour it back into Andrew now. So I, man, dude, you're, you're such a hustler. I, I, I love that story. Thanks. And I mean, you know, be honest with you, I didn't even want to be a real estate agent. I literally just became a real estate agent to provide value to my mentor, to provide value in the form of commissions. 
Um, and then I could, I'm essentially his employee. So I, under the, under the auspices of being one of his real estate agents, I can give him a call and ask him any question I want. Right. So that to your point, like when you're looking for a mentor, don't think what they can give you, think what you can give that and provide value to them. And once you provide value, then ask for something in return. But as we all know, these very successful people, um, don't have a lot of time. Right. And if you're not going to give them any direction, you're not going to provide value. A lot of times they don't have, they, they don't, they don't have incentive other than the, other than the goodness of their heart to pour into you. I, one of the things I wanted to touch on was just like the, the lending piece. Um, what are some things that maybe new investors might not know about like the lending side of getting into commercial real estate? Um, so the amazing thing about commercial real estate is, um, it, it combines finance. So if you partner with two or three people, it combines all of your finances together to get to, um, to, uh, show you have the DTI to, uh, to get a loan on that particular property. So, um, a lot of, a lot of investors like myself, after you buy a certain amount of properties and you don't have two years of rental income, your debt to income ratio catches up with you and it's really hard to get loans, but a nice hurdle, a nice, a nice cheat code to get over that is to partner with people on deals and they combine all your finances together in one package. And then that really gets you over that DTI hump. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's another reason why I kind of went from small residential to commercial. So I could really utilize partners to get over that DTI, DTI hump for sure. Andrew, thank you for going through that that deal with us. I think there were some great little tidbits in there that everyone can learn from. And congratulations on that cash flow. That's awesome. It sounds like a pretty cool deal just for doing a couple months of increasing the rent. So I want to take us to our next segment. This is the Rookie Request Line. You guys can give us a call at one 888 5 and leave us a voicemail. We may play your question on the show. So today's question is from Tom in South Carolina. Hey guys, love the show. Just trying to get in the process of getting a HELOC on my primary residence. I am just wondering what kind of paperwork you should have already to bring to a local bank if that's the route you're trying to take and what you should be bringing prepared to talk about. Love to hear you guys' input. Thank you. So basically, Andrew, he wants to know what um, kind of paperwork, what should he have prepared to bring to the bank to get that line of credit? And should he have knowledge of anything else um, that he should be prepared to talk about? Well, before you actually apply for the HELOC, make sure you're actually getting the best HELOC possible. And the way I recommend that is kind of identifying um, the 50, that all banks in a 50 mile radius and call every single one, right? See what HELOCs they have available. See what's best for you. Because not all HELOCs are created equal. Like for my first HELOC, I had a ton of equity, right? So there's HELOCs that offer you better terms at 80 to 85% equity. If you have a lot of equity, those are really good options. If you don't have a lot of equity, there are actually HELOCs that go up to 100%, but those, go, those have worse terms, right? So it depends on your needs and how much equity you have on what the right HELOC is for you. Regarding a HELOC, that's just a normal mortgage. More or less, it's a lien. So it's everything a normal mortgage would need. You know, your tax returns you know, your, your, um, work information, um, things of that nature. And a lot of times the great thing about HELOCs is their interest only, right? And people don't really realize this, but when you're actually going for loans, they take into account the minimum, minimum payment when calculating your debt to income ratio. So HELOCs, you can actually borrow a lot against it. And it doesn't actually detriment you too much when you go to lenders, because they only take into account the interest on that money and not the principal plus interest, if that makes sense. Can you um, touch it to like, how many lines of credit have you done, Andrew? So I, I did one line of credit on my one bedroom condo in Boston. I bought it in 2015 for 222. It appreciated to around 400,000. So come around COVID, I opened up a 200K line of credit. I utilized that to buy, I think my next seven deals. My first house hack, um, I used my line of credit for my down payment on that. I think I did that with an FHA, a 3.5% down. I used about 40K from there. And then once, uh, once I was in that property and I was actually ready to house hack to my next property, I always recommend this before you move from one house hack to another house hack, open up a line of credit on that house hack. They have hundred percent HELOCs up to three to four families, right? So I actually opened up a $75,000 line of credit on my, on my first house hack before I moved to my second house hack. Right. And I'm actually planning on opening up a line of credit on my second house hack before I move. Right. So it's really important to to have the ability to access that equity, right? Um, and 
you know, as many of us, we got amazing first lien loans. Like most of my loan, most of my loans are like two to 4%, right? I want to keep that loan. That is a huge asset, but I want to utilize that equity. And I do that via lines of credit. And yes, lines of credit have higher interest rates, maybe seven, eight and a half now, but your overall blended rate across both of those loans, you know, your, your, lien, your first lien, your second lien is by far lower than going through the, re, the refinance process. That's a great point that blended rate is looking at it in that scenario as to taking the two rates and, you know, bringing the average together and comparing it as to if you were to go refinance, pay the closing cost, pay the higher interest rate than that two or three percent that you currently have on your your mortgage. Um, so when it comes to growing and scaling, you know, I really think of it like a hedge fund more or less. So when I'm actually opening up these line of credits, right, and I'm borrowing at a seven or an eight percent, I just have to ensure whatever I'm moving those money into, it provides a higher return. So I'm arbitraging one return from one fund into another fund. And that's really how I've been able to scale. You know, ever since I've gotten to real estate, it literally took me, it took me around 10 years <laughs> to accumulate $250,000 in net worth. You know, in a period of two years, I 3X that through utilizing arbitrage and, and more or less thinking like a hedge fund, right? Like how can I borrow one pot of money and arbitrage that into a higher return? Um, it's been a very effective strategy for me. And I highly recommend people do that as long as they're doing it in a safe way. You know, you have a decent amount of reserves. Maybe you have a 401k to fall back on. Maybe, you know, maybe your parents will support you if you get in rough times, but you have to have a backup plan if you are planning to use leverage. Otherwise, it's not a smart decision. It, that right there is a great disclaimer. And I'm glad you said that because I think people get excited about the, you know, I don't have to have any money to invest in real estate. I can just leverage this property to move to this property and go and refinance and do lines of credit and all these things. But you're right. Like you still have to have those reserves in place and tapping into other assets such as your 401k, you know, you're able to draw a loan from your 401k if you absolutely needed to, or if somebody has, you know, a, a brokerage account, um, they could take a line of credit against their brokerage account, things like that. So um, knowing what, like what your actual liquidity is in a situation, you know, if things do take a turn for the worse is where can you pull money from to get yourself out of that bad situation? I think it's very important. You know, to really scale and grow in real estate, you really have to utilize the compound effect, right? So for all the property that I own, you know, for all the rental income that I get, I literally have taken, I think about $200, <laughs> from my properties in cash flow. I literally just let that recycle and compound and I really live off my W-2 income. You know, I, I recommend people all the time, like your W-2 in, in regards to real estate, your W-2 is really, is, is really is an asset, right? Cause it, it, it gives you, uh, uh, it gives you flexibility to go after the best loan products. Um, and as we all know in real estate, that is your highest line item. That's your most expensive line item. So if you can get the best deal in debt, you can actually make deals work that don't work for other people. Yeah, Andrew, I'm so glad you touched on like recycling that that profit back into the business because most people, I think, they take money out of the business too soon. And for us in our in our business, we had I think 14 properties on Airbnb before we took a single penny out of the business, and every other dollar was going back into the business to help fund the next deal, to renovate our existing properties, to make improvements, add better experiences. And that decision to hold off made all the difference, right? Because now there is a snowball that started to form. And even now with, you know, we're at like almost 30 properties on Airbnb, we still take a relatively small salary from all of those properties. And the majority is going back into now mostly people, right? We're, we've been hiring a lot of people to help put the systems and processes in place to be able to continue to scale this business. So if you're listening and your goal is to build a large portfolio um, I think it is prudent to try and reinvest as much as you can back into the business early on so that you can do a little bit better down the road. Um, so, Andrew, I want to take us to our next segment here, which is the rookie exam. Uh, these are the three most important questions you will ever be asked in your life. So, Andrew, are you ready for these three questions? Let's go. All right. Question number one, what's one actionable thing rookie should do after listening to your episode? Take action. Take action, right? Like my biggest advice to new investors is start shooting out offers, right? Cast a wide net, right? And, and my, my advice to you for, for that particular strategy would be look at properties with 40 plus days on market, 
Start writing up offers 50% of list prices. Just shoot them off. Shoot them off. You're literally cast, casting out a wide net, right? And you're seeing who's willing to buy, who's willing to negotiate, who's motivated to sell, right? And once you have somebody on that fishing line, you got to pull them in slowly. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll veer off. Maybe they'll get rid of the line. But at that point, you really figure out who the motivated sellers are. And you really can go after the properties that make sense. Um, so that would be my advice is really focus on those tasks that are going to get you to your goal, right? This does that mean get a line of credit. Does that mean underwrite deals? Does that mean walk properties? Does that mean talk with lenders? Does that mean, you know, reach out to brokers? Like these are the things that get you to your goals, right? If you're just posting on social media and you have no deals done, stop it. <laughs> focus on the activities that will get you your first deal. That's a great point because even I've done this before when I've started different businesses or little side hustles as I get caught up in my logo design, I need to order my business card. It's like, you don't need any of that <laughs> to get started. Get that, get that first customer. That's the key. Get that and first customer. That's, oh yeah. What is one tool, software, app, or system in your business that you use? I do. I love apartments.com. Um, so whenever I take ownership of a property, I ensure all of my tenants sign up for apartment.com and they're set up an auto pay. First of all, rent collection, you know, when you own 18 units, you got to chase, chase people down for checks. That's an absolute time killer, right? So when I set up people on apartments.com, I literally just sign on on the first of the month. I see if their payment's processing or not. If it isn't, I just shoot off quick text. A lot of times it's just tech issues. They fix it. Bada bing, bada boom. I get paid. So my rent collection, I don't know, it probably takes me I don't know, 20 minutes a month, right? But if I didn't have that software in place, if I was collecting checks, if I was collecting cash, if, you know, that would literally take hours upon hours every month, right? So it's all about those time, of those, those, those time efficiency. It's all about time efficiency and utilizing, um, utilizing strategies to really automate your, your management of your properties. All right, Andrew, last question. Where do you plan on being in five years? I... Well, first of all, one of my ultimate goals is to help other people reach financial independence. You know, if I, you know, if I did that, if I gave to the world that I feel like, I feel like I'd given more to the world than what I took and I could really die happy. So that's kind of one of my ultimate goals is really to mentor and help others achieve that, that financial independence. Uh, my next goal, you know, and, and kind of along those lines, I would love to start syndicating large multifamily. That's definitely down the path of me for sure. Um, and then lastly, you know, I want to travel. I want to visit a hundred countries. I want to see the world. I want to experience, you know, experience everything this world has to offer. Um, so th that's kind of what I, what I envision my life to be like in five years. Sounds like a, an amazing five-year plan. I don't think I've heard one. So, uh, so like, um, uh, I don't know, like energizing since we've been on the podcast, man. So I love that, Andrew. So let me finish off by giving a shout out to this week's uh, Ricky Rockstar. So this week's Rockstar is Homer Olivares. And Homer says, today we close on our first deal. We're officially landlords. This is the first of many to come, but we officially took our first step towards financial freedom. We can't thank Bigger Pockets and everyone in the forums enough for all the help. This will be our first house hack, and we are also first time home buyers. Now, here's the cool part about Homer's story. He says, we came into the closing table with zero money and are actually getting a check written to us for about $580. When they say you can buy a property with low and no money down, we were able to experience it firsthand. So Homer, congratulations to you on that amazing first deal. Yeah, and you know, and that's just a testament to everything Bigger Pockets does for the community. You know, you guys really make a difference in people's lives and um, you've probably helped millions of people reach financial independence. So um, you literally work for one of the best organizations I know of and I, I'm internally grateful to you as well. I would not be where I'm at without you guys, so thank you. Well, we feel incredibly grateful that we're the ones that get to sit here and get to interact with the guests because, I mean, it's the guests that give the real value. We just use our curiosity to pick and probe more. <laughs> How are you doing that? Because we want to do it. <laughs> but thank you. We appreciate that, Andrew. Can you let everyone know where they can reach out to you and find out some more information about you? Yeah, absolutely. You can follow me uh, on Instagram at InvestorFree.com. You can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, at Andrew Freed. Um, and yeah, I'm also an agent in Worcester, Massachusetts. I focus on investment property, multifamily. So feel free to reach out. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode. Andrew, you brought tremendous value to our listeners and we really appreciated having you on. If you guys haven't already, make sure you have joined the Real Estate Rookie 
Facebook group and are subscribed to our YouTube channel, Real Estate Rookie. Please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform and tell us what you're doing in your real estate investing career because we love to, you know, read them on the podcast. I'm Ashley at Well From Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And we'll see you guys next time. Still, yeah.